Welcome everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of the book, Gendered Institutions and Women's Political Representation in Africa, edited by staff member Diana Holland Madsen, which is published within our Africa Now series of Z books and brings together an illustrious author group from institutions in Africa, Europe and America. Um, I think it's particularly pertinent that this book um, reflects on critical issues related to women's representation and acts as an exemplar of the type of critical social sciences knowledge and reflective debate that we're very privileged to support at the Nordic Africa Institute. And also sitting here in Sweden too, the topic within NICE's nice thematic area on gender has particular resonance given the value that is placed on feminist foreign policy and gender equality in Sweden. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce co-authors of the edited volume and members of this panel, Professor Amanda Gauss, um, Professor of Political Science, the University of Stellenbosch, South Africa, uh, Sethunya Masime, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Botswana, Maud de Kolbe, Senior Lecturer, Department of English, University of Botswana, Asiata Chiweza, Associate Professor, Department of Political and Administrative Studies, University of Malawi. Catherine Forshe, Associate Professor and Di Director, Griot Institute for Black Lives and Culture, Bucknell University, USA. Marla Jacks, Associate Professor, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, the College of New Jersey, USA. Sheila Mamusi, um, PhD in research consultant on governance and institutional development in Kenya and Germany. Monica Osidari, senior lecturer, Department of Economics, Obafemo Wololo University, Nigeria. And we're hoping to be joined by Mandidita Perici, lecturer, Department of Peace, Midland State University, Zimbabwe, uh, connection issues willing. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Diana Hola Madsen to uh, give a little presentation on the book. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Uh, as Eleanor stated, the book is part of the Africa Now series published by Set Books, and uh, which is now part of Bloomsbury. I think something funny is happening with my video. Sorry for that. Anyhow, the book is an outcome of a workshop which, were, which took place in Uppsala at the Nordic Africa Institute in December 2018. The focus is on gendered institutions. Uh, I will also share uh, my screen with you. The focus on gendered institutions is indirectly a focus on uh, meso levels. This means that, oh, sorry about this. But <clears throat> it's somehow in the middle ground. In much research, focus on, has been on the micro level that is uh, on women's individual capacities and a form of uh, deficit in relation to this, or alternatively on the macro level, with, for example, a focus on electoral systems in a somewhat uh, deterministic manner. It's important to underline that the focus is on informal as well as formal institutions, and that uh, institutions are understood in a relative broad sense in relation to, to this book. The book also demonstrates how informal institutions are working against more women in politics. For example, in the Kenyan chapter with a focus on Enkanit, that is respect for the elderly and related shaming and shunning of very vocal women, and also in relation to slave politics in South Africa. The book is building on insights by existing research on respectively women's political representation and also feminist institutionalism. 
the focus on women's political representation uh, in Africa is not a new gender issue, but this book combines these two in new and innovative uh, ways. And it's also introducing a first step towards an African feminist institutionalism. The book has eight case studies uh, from English speaking countries, that is South Africa, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Kenya, Ghana, Botswana and Nigeria, with very different levels of women's political representation at the national level. The introduction of formal gender equality reforms in the form of quota in the, in the so-called success country has been part of changes after respective post-conflict uh, settings and a related reconfiguration of power relations and also processes of broader constitutional reforms. Generally, more attention has been given to these so-called success countries. And when I say so-called, I, I, it, it, uh, it indicates that, for example, the South African case studies study illustrates that the introduction of quota has not meant any substantive changes. However, the book also provides some insights into the less successful cases and perhaps also less studied cases in terms of women's political representation like Ghana, Botswana and Nigeria to understand some of the institutional arrangement and also mechanisms of exclusion in these contexts. The book identifies a need for moving beyond a polarized debate pro against affirmative action measures and rather focus on their variations and workings in specific African contexts. Here are the, uh, the processes of working and variations. <clears throat> and it also looks into the importance of looking into how women are selected and their possibilities for adapting a pro-gender equality agenda within very masculinist institutional context. Feminist institutionalism, which is the theoretical approach that this book is inspired by, sees institution as gender rules, norms and processes and related, uh, they produce gendered outcomes. And as stated earlier, there's a focus on both formal and informal institutions. Generally, institutions are understood as rules and procedures that structure society by constraining and enabling actors' behavior. That's a definition by Valen. So these formal and informal institutions act in very complex and complicated ways Especially the book has a focus on the informal institutions that sort of flies under the radar uh, and tries to make them visible and uncover or unveil the, the hidden lives of these institutions, because this provides a potential for change and also a potential for regendering patriarchal institutions through in-depth research in line with the uh, political ethnography in the diverse uh, case studies. In the book, uh, we draw on Valen's definition of, of informal institution, implying socially shared rules, often unwritten, that are created, communicated, and enforced outside of officially sanctioned channels. Generally, the approach of feminist institutional, institutionalism has proven very useful as a lens for analyzing women's political representation in African contexts characterized by informality and patronage uh, networks. More, more theory generations generating should start from African realities 
The diverse case studies can be seen as a stepping stone towards building a specific African feminist institutionalism as a precondition for reshaping African institution. And the three steps that the book I outlines or hints at is firstly a re-excavation of the past moving beyond the colonial through analyzing how colonial structures influence institutional arrangements of the prison. And also an inspiration uh, from female icons, that is either female icons from the independence movement or, or also from pre-colonial times. Second, a number of authors highlight the role of African feminism in reshaping patriarchal institutions, especially with a reference to negro feminism. That is non ego or a focus on nego negotiation, compromise and balance as a strategy, a way forward for changing institutions. And then a third step is also to develop African concepts on gendered institutions. For example, some of the chapters focus or relate to the concept of first lady syndrome. And there's also a focus on a politics of insults, ridicule and rumors. So the research questions that have been guiding the book and the case studies are, why have women's political representation developed so unevenly on the African continent? And which role do institutions play in, is, in explaining these uneven developments? First, and then there is this mapping of trying to identify which formal and informal institutions are influential in different African contexts. And how could an African feminist institutionalism be characterized? So I think this is uh, all I will highlight about uh, the book at this point. And uh, I will uh, give the floor to Josephine Ahekir from Makarea University, um, who is a specialist in the area of gender and politics and who is a former dean and uh, has been teaching and researching at the Women's and Gender Studies in Macarera and has also done several books in the area of gender and politics. I'm looking very much, or we are looking very much forward to your comments, Josephine. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, um, Diane, uh, for this very uh, interesting highlight of the book on gendered institutions and women's political representation. Um, I must say I was privileged to read this book, a rich menu of eight chapters, uh, and looking also at a new, call, you know, the sort of different perspective around uh, feminist institutionalism and um, the issue of women's political participation. So in this sense, I would like to really congratulate the editor, uh, Diane Madsen, for the leadership, because editing a book is a, a role uh, of, of leadership, leading the other authors in a way that you're able to deliver on an edited book. Uh, also, congratulations to the authors. These are very interesting perspectives. Uh, and also I'd like to thank the Nordic African Institute uh, because we say, uh, for example, that there is a relative um, book farming in these areas, especially in, in the area of feminist theorization uh, on the African continent. So in a way, this is really watering uh, that desert and, and we are uh, glad that um, this is a resource that will be able uh, to be um, you know, added on to the resources in the teaching and other engagements on feminist uh, scholarship on the continent and beyond. 
and uh, the 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 ways in which also the the, the book has taken on uh, the the issue of, of political participation is beyond the conventional kind of uh, treatment around uh, looking at at individual actions of, of women political actors. So generally, um, as uh, scholarship on the African continent, uh, the issue of women's political participation has spanned broad uh, debates. And one of the, uh, the, the, the key debates has been around the, the uh, pre-colonial uh, sort of um, trajectory coming also into the nationalist struggles and in terms of women's positionality and roles, uh, especially the, the top player leadership. I say top player because uh, quite often we, we focus on the sort of um, visible uh, leadership roles and forget the, the middle and, and lower layers. But of course, the, the looking at, at, at what has been written so far, I think that uh, this book also sort of reincarnates some of the, of the, of the um, positions around the, the sort of pre-colonial and, and some roles in the nationalist struggles. And of course, then there's a question of to be or not to be, uh, the question of quotas. Uh, that debate uh, as of now has been a little bit um, uh, retired, some form of affirmative action for a number of African countries. And actually those countries that don't have it, like Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya are sort of outliers and that is something that, that is also uh, coming out. We've also had conversations around um, when women got into uh, these positions, especially in, in parliament and local governments. There was that quick question about, uh, but we need to go beyond numbers. The whole issue of uh, descriptive versus uh, substantive representation. And of course, scholars around the continent also engaged with this question at the risk of falling into the trap of, of othering women as individuals as, or as a collective uh, in that sense. Now, um, feminist institutionalism, beyond the paternalistic analysis, looking at the role of institution and the nested nature of political participation. This is where the book is anchored. And I would actually say, you know, it is anchored into the future, so to say, uh, to attempt to, to sort of explicate the, the critical roles of institutions, of the, of the rules that underlie actors, behavior, uh, political ideologies, and assumptions. And so we see, for example, the purposing, the repurposing of state institutions as uh, explicated by the, the South African um, case uh, by Amanda Goes. And most importantly, alerting us to that notion of how uh, that repurposing actually is embedded also within the nature of politics and, and, and creating, so to say, a shadow of the state. And those, really the informal institutions in this sense is not about that which is not formal. Uh, it's not just that, but it's, it's also the politics of it in the sense that it averts uh, certain processes and is also dominated by masculinist dispositions that are able to, to, to sort of create patriarchal resilience uh, in, in many of the cases that we are talking about. Uh, we see also in the case of, of Zimbabwe, 
Parichi lays out the, this, the, the case of, of, of double uh, bind dilemma. Um, a female politician, Joyce, who is in a sense sort of reified, but still in representation in the media, creating or building up a case for um, females as inherently incapable and unfit uh, as politicians. And we see also uh, the other chapter on training. We recall, for example, Sarah Longwe, who argued that training of women, training of uh, women candidates, you know, all these empowerment um, kinds of initiatives are sort of politically located in an assumption that women have a lack, that they lack something, and that therefore they need to be upgraded, which is basically a masculinist uh, ideology that, that is embedded in uh, constructing women as, as secondary and as the other. Now, the, the, the chapter from, from Botswana uh, faces this question and say, is training therefore um, an act in futility? And of course, uh, the answers to these may not be out of the context. And in Botswana, it shows uh, an organization that has creatively maybe uh, sort of uh, navigated. But training in a sense is uh, training of women is embedded in the fact that instead of actually transforming the status quo, you, you, you seek to get women to be uh, um, absorbed into the, the, the androcentric uh, template. Uh, so in a sense, um, the, the training at that broad level is actually a, a sort of um, liberalist um, approach to gender relations. But in this case, uh, we are seeing uh, that uh, a, a few attempts uh, have been done to sort of also move away from the concentration of um, political participation only in terms of positions or seats in parliament or in local government and looking at a broad array of engagement and, 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 and this also shows us uh, how uh, those types of engagements have seen women continue to engage in political parties, even in the face of declining seats uh, in the Botswana case. And also broadening, trying to, to, to attempt to get us to broaden the, the perspective around political participation beyond seats to, to individuals. Uh, from Malawi, uh, we are treated to a nuanced conversation on informality. Again, the role of informal institutions and the, the, the sort of conclusion is about the need to, to go beyond these um, uh, informalities in candidature selection and primaries, uh, especially in terms of the pa political party function. And of course, when we talk about informal rules, there are beneficiaries and it won't be the beneficiaries to remove or reform the way political parties work because informal institutions also benefit uh, certain uh, political centers. And that is something that has to be um, enmeshed with the fact that then you actually need a strong counter narrative or, or, or counter activity, especially with regard to the women's movement. Um, and then we are also um, treated to the story on uh, Tanzania, uh, BBTT, 
uh, who you know is central in most of the uh, stories around uh, Tanzania's struggle uh, for liberation, uh, independence, and so on. Uh, she would be there, but the the authors um, also alert us to the fact that we need to have a conscious effort to challenge normative erasures, distortions, and and exclusions. Again, the issues is around uh, the, the issue is around the fact that. Most of, of what has been written, especially in the last uh, two decades or so, has been around victimhood, women's oppression, and so on. But the, the kinds of contributions that, that women have made to society, African women have made to society, tend to be a little bit um, erased or averted in a way that they are not able to make uh, a political kind of entitlement on that story. Coming closer to Kenya, I'm in, I'm in Uganda, so that's why I'm saying closer to Kenya. Uh, the, the experiences around gender legislation, and um, we see Kenya as a sort of living contradiction. You have very active uh, women in civil society, but this doesn't seem actually to translate into uh, political um, seats in terms of uh, seats in legislatures and so on. And the, the, the conclusion that, that the author makes is that um, the changes in the, in the formal rules, let's say a very good constitution that Kenya has, will not guarantee implementation in the changes because of course, uh, recalling what Naira Kabil has, has talked about, about the critical components of institutional transformation, which include collective and individual agency, which include negotiation at individual, community, and state levels, which also include uh, changes uh, at, at all levels, institutional levels, including uh, the household which means that um, even when we have this constitution and things are not going well, we shouldn't actually pose it as a question why, but we should now uh, try to find out what is it that is animating these blockages. Our informal rules and institutions, what is the place of these institutions and how are they operating? for us to be able to actually have strategies that are able to avert these um, uh, uh, rules. And of course, uh, in the broad discussions, uh, it has been argued that not all informal rules are actually uh, against um, progress or transformation because some of those rules can be used to uh, negotiate. And of course, that is also a slippery ground uh, because negotiation may mean uh, that you, you, you have to uh, tone down some of the positions, you have to go along, you have to swim along on some instances. And therefore it, it means that for negotiation to be politically alert to transformational change, for transformational imperatives, there is need for a strong, consistent uh, women's lobby, a, a movement that is able to track and, 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 and demand uh, accountability. Um, and then we have uh, Nigeria and, and, and Ghana. Those stories, um, these are two countries in, in, in West Africa that in many ways uh, in our history on the African continent are projected as, as those where we have had strong at least in the written history, strong 
female actors across the grain, across the societal uh, trajectory in, in households, in the markets, in, um, in the cultural institutions, uh, where we also read about um, uh, writings like of, of Ifi, Amadiume, uh, Oyeronke, and so on. And this are, at least for Nigeria, is one of those few countries that have a single digit uh, representation in parliament. Uh, so you have this very powerhouse uh, of Africa with a single digit um, uh, representation. And somehow uh, we, we, we want to see what is it that actually um, blocks this seemingly um, strong kind of female identity in politics that does not actually translate into um, visible uh, political participation or uh, entitlement. And, and, and for Ghana, um, as a reader, I was actually surprised that they are still struggling with affirmative action. Some of us have, are almost tired of affirmative action. It has worked for over 20 years. And look at Ghana, one of actually few countries where uh, we can record that there's a semblance of democratic politics. And you then have this struggle with the basic affirmative action for us is like a, a sort of basic, um, you know, a basic change in terms of entitlement to political participation. So what is blocking uh, progress? And given that, you know, Ghana is, is, should be a leading country, uh, what is it that animates this slow progress? And as, as Anne-Marie has really argued, um, and, and, and Amina Mama, the thing is not really about lack of political will. Uh, lack of political will is, is a sort of uh, an understatement on the understanding of what is going on in terms of political power, what is animating uh, these um, sort of uh, blockages, what are the pathways to political power and who holds power and how is very, very important. And so in, in summary, uh, what we really uh, take from this book and what should also constitute an agenda for African feminism in this area is that there is uh, a need for increased comparative uh, studies, especially now um, in the past, past two decades, we've been talking about uh, post-conflict societies, post-conflict countries. South Africa was among them. Uh, Uganda was among them. Um, uh, all, the, all these countries, uh, Kenya was also partly among them. With the new constitutions now and, and the new governments and so on, what is it, how do we categorize what is going on? What are the, um, the um, factors at play? How do we classify what is going on? And uh, in this sense, we also need to recall what um, uh, Fiona McKay has called the new in the old, but also really looking at the impact of neoliberal orthodoxy this very single story that is embedded within uh, what governments are doing, but still uh, being able to avert even some of the uh, few uh, progressive efforts across uh, the world, specifically across the African uh, continent. 
And in this regard, we also look at the orthodoxy that flips into uh, the global uh, frameworks, the UN and the, what Amina Mama has called the UN feminism and how it is also um, layered within the, 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 repurposed, the repurposed state institutions and how that goes into uh, subverting uh, progressive uh, movements and efforts, uh, especially by the women's movements to change, uh, uh, to advocate for legislation and to, to seek for substantive, uh, transformative and redistributive uh, gender justice. So in conclusion, I would say that this book uh, is a resource and it really bounces us forward in terms of uh, creating uh, the knowledge that is beyond the, the sort of conventional, individualistic, particularistic uh, way of looking at women political actors and looking at how constituencies are built, how networks are built, and how it's important to understand the workings and the politics of the meso level. Congratulations to all the authors. Thank you very much. Josephine, thank you very much. Some excellent points of reflection that you've raised, and I certainly think you have whetted appetites um, for anyone who hasn't read the book to, to start reading. Um, I'm about to turn to authors themselves in just a minute, but before I do, I'd like to um, urge audience members, please don't feel shy about putting questions in the uh, question and answer function. First of all, I'll, I'll turn to the authors and then I will start raising the questions that you're asking. So please feel free to go ahead and do this. Um, but Amanda, if I could turn to you first. Um, from your chapter on feminist institutionalism, women's representation and state capture, um, the, the case of South Africa, when considering the gendered nature of state capture and feminist institutionalism in this context, what are some of the key messages that you would like to convey to the audience um, from your work? Thank you. And, and let me start by, by thanking Diana for her editorship of this book and the very stimulating workshop we did at the Nordic Africa Institute um, at the end of 2018. Um, I think this is an important book uh, to, to, as Josephina says, take us forward to a state feminism in, uh, in Africa. Um, let me start by saying the South African case is always considered or has been considered thus far um, as, a, as a success story, um, as a story of an integrated set of structures in the state to pr promote gender equality uh, in the, the legislative uh, chamber, the parliament, in the executive, in the speaker's office, um, and the autonomous um, Commission for Gender Equality that's uh, protected by the constitution as well as gender desks in, in the civil service. And for a lot, uh, for the first five years of the new democracy that worked really well. But then things uh, went awry and uh, many of these structures have been uh, demobilized um, and rolled back. And my argument that I make is that it's not um, the, the formal structures, those structures that I've just mentioned, plus a 50% quota from the ruling party, um, but it is the informal uh, structures that has uh, really done a lot of damage to state feminism in South Africa. I look at three in my chapter at three specific um, informal types of, of norms and behavior that, that's been quite uh, damaging. And the first one is what is called in the South African context, slate politics. And this is when um, the ruling party uh, that, well, the, the electoral system in South Africa is a closed list um, proportional system, which means that parties put uh, members on closed list and, and they fill the seats from the top of the list uh, in relation to the, the percentage of uh, support they get, get. 
Now, the, the way it's supposed to work is that, you know, names get put on the list on the branch level, then it goes up to provincial level where it's shuffled and looked at gender, race, class, disability, all those markers, and then it goes to the national level where the finalists are put together. What slave politics does is that um, different factions in the ruling party present a already formulated slate of names ready to go onto the list. Um, there's no shuffling and very often it excludes women. It's, it's not fair and equitable in terms of the representation of women. And when women get onto the slates, they become beholden to the men in the factions, which means they cannot actually uh, put together a gender agenda and, and put uh, issues that's beneficial to women um, on the agenda. So, so slate politics also means that people uh, get redeployed. If you've been found to be incompetent or corrupt, you just get shuffled away to another level from national to provincial or provincial to, to local, and it still leaves the same um, incompetent people in, in political positions. So it's a, it's a very detrimental practice. The second one has got to do with what's called in South Africa state capture. And this is large scale corruption, uh, where corruption uh, has to do with the um, bending of rules or uh, bypassing rules, um, especially in relation to the Public Procurement Financial Act. This is the large scale repurposing of institutions um, for a constellation of rent seeking individuals that change the mandates of the institutions and change the way that they are governing. Uh, are being governed and managed. And this means that, you know, institutions that were uh, formulated specifically with the idea of uh, promoting gender equality in the state, then becomes um, repurposed for other purposes. And what we've seen um, is the, um, uh, going together with this is the loyalty, um, cater loyalty to the ruling party, which means that compliant women are then chosen to, to run some of these institutions. And this is why we've seen the rollback of all those, the Office of the Status of Women, uh, the Joint Monitoring Committee on the Quality of Life and the Status of Women in Parliament. Um, we've seen uh, the capture of the Commission for Gender Equality by uh, the ruling party, Party's Women's League. Um, and we've seen that all those structures are either dysfunctional or rolled back. And what we got in its place is a single body, a women's ministry. That right from the start, feminists in South Africa said, we don't want the ministry because then everything gets ghettoized in that ministry and it doesn't really go down to the policy level. So this ministry is called the Ministry for Women, Youth and People with Disabilities, which means it's already a conglomeration of very dispersed um, and, and divergent needs. Um, and this ministry in the past, it was inaugurated in 2009, has never managed to reach more than 28% of its targets. So it is, it's not contributing to state feminism uh, in the state. And then the, 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 the third issue that I looked at is the compliant women. And this is the politics of women's leagues. So many, um, parties in Africa, especially where there were liberation movements, have women's leagues. And these women leagues um, are actually um, buy into a nationalist uh, political ideology. Uh, and they, they frame women um, as, as the mothers of the nation. It is anti-transformative, it is conservative, and it is not feminist. And so what we see are compliant women who are either part of factions um, or they are, they are gatekeepers to other positions in the state uh, that are supposed to promote gender equality. And, and as I mentioned, the, the Commission for Gender Equality has been captured by the Women's League, which means that that critical oversight function of the Gender Commission is completely silenced. Um, the, 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 the oversight over policymaking does not happen, or it happens in a very limited way, um, and it is therefore beholden to the political party, the ruling party, and it's beholden to the Women's League. And these three sort of informal um, institutions have really undermined the formal institutions to the extent that they are 
shells of their, their former selves. Thank you, Amanda, really interesting. And um, looking forward, do you see any shifts to these formal institutions? Perhaps positive, perhaps negative, or is it very much business as usual? Nothing changes. Well, I think while we battling um, the, the patrimony and patron client relations in South Africa, that's combined with serious corruption, we're going to struggle. Mm. But can make a difference uh, is is the link with the women's movement. So the women's movement um, has been very fractured. Um, I've in my other work look at what I call localized temporal movements, which are feminist and and women's organization coming together around pieces of legislation and really doing good work. But it's only for a limited time time span and then they disappear. So I think there is really, and we see it now with this very high levels of gender-based violence in South Africa, that we, we see um, movements, hashtag total shutdown, hashtag end rape culture, that's actually mobilizing women. So, so it's not as though the women's movement has disappeared. The context is just very complicated. But the women's movement need to, to really, I think, take up the issues of state feminism, which has been not talked about a lot uh, in, in the South African context. And then I, I'm glad that Josephine raised the issue of new liberalism and new liberal management, because I think it does a, a great deal of, of disservice to these institutions, uh, especially um, when it's on a global level, uh, that uh, uh, gender mainstreaming has not been very successful and it's actually deactivated and demobilized women's activism. So, and that really, um, I think also, manifests uh, in, in what looks as uh, the lack of a political will. Um, and, and the compliant women together with the state capture and, and this new liberal tick boxes and, and, and so on, uh, it really doesn't give us an idea that there's a political will to deal with gender issues. And I think this is, so, so we need a large scale mobilization. I think there is a space for, for um, state feminism in Africa. And, and we've shown that we can design these structures, but our political context is, is different in many ways from, um, from the global north. And we need to take it back to, to conditions of colonialism that's led to these large scale liberation movements um, that really struggle to transform themselves into political parties. And that really undermines the rules and the formal rules of, of democratic states. Um, and I think that's our challenge um, as, as scholars from Africa. Absolutely, yes, I concur. Amanda, thank you very much. I'd like to turn now to Mendaza Parici um, and move northwards um, to Zimbabwe um, and your chapter, Confronting the Double Bind Dilemma in the Representation of Joyce Majuru in the Zimbabwean newspapers, which um, Josephine has already raised. Um, in the context of debates over the empowerment of women in the post-independence period in Zimbabwe, um, what would you say one of the key findings from your research is regarding how the media represents female politicians and the biases and stereotypes that this might involve? Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Diana, for uh, this opportunity and the opportunity to have um, come to Sweden to, for the workshop and uh, this book that we are launching today. Um, Back to your question, Elena, I, I, when I look at the situation of Zimbabwe and my focus really was about socialization of um, me, of, uh, of um, constructs, in, in fact, constructs of, um, by the media around female politicians. You find that in most instances, what the media writes about female politicians is mostly centered around stereotypes which disadvantage female politicians. So I really, I focused on Joyce Mujuru because uh, from the time of independence, Mujuru was just one lady who was consistently in the Zimbabwean parliament. And my chapter tests the applicability of the double bind theory around her career. And what I noted from um, uh, Joyce Mujuru's uh, career as a politician was that she did not have much power. You find that even in terms of the 
Ooh, have you lost connection? And it's there? Are you there? We can come back. And it's there? Okay, well, let us come back. And I'm going to move on. Um, Tatunya and Maud. I don't know which one of you would like to answer a question on your chapter, but going south to Botswana, your, your chapter focuses is another one that uh, Josephine has nicely introduced, focuses on candidate training programs in Africa, asking whether a waste of resources um, or pedagogies of oppressed relating to Frarian thinking um, uh, can come out. And you use the case of um, specific training workshops that were conducted in Zimbabwe, a very nice case study. What's the main learning that you had from this case study on party biases and why indeed women um, still find this space attractive um, in relation um, to their attempts to command political space? I'd be particularly interested to hear. Please. Um, hello. Thank you, Elena. Okay. Um... Mandy is back. Maybe let's let her come back. Um, hi. Andita, can you hear us? We'll come back, please. Go ahead and we'll come back. Okay, thank you very much. I see a lot of people in the attendee list and I'm also very happy to see people that I met um, in a cold, um, in a cold Nordic country where we had a very good time and to see us here again is such an amazing thing. Um, and the questions that we're trying to work around are not new questions and they'll stay around to the extent that politics shift, um, neoliberal politics in Africa shift um, and the understanding of leadership is also shifting. Um, personally, I'm beginning to be drawn to the idea of party politics really being coming to a cell by date, so that while we're trying to get into that space as in representation, we need to think about representation more broader than what's happening within political parties, because in, and this is something that Amanda Gauss also um, has already talked about, about and, and, and many of the people in this room about how Political parties um, become much more of a vehicle towards um, power understood as access to financial resources in the different mechanisms in different countries towards sort of creating what you might call um, a clique of those with um, against the majority that is without. And in that space, you find that women remain the heaviest carriers of development work, the actual development work, the actual um, work um, within communities, they are the change makers. But when it comes to the formal institutions um, and recognition, then because of the outcomes that um, the, the sort of patriarchal politics seems to tend towards, um, you find that then party politics really do not become about development. I think there's a very poor relationship between party politics and, and development. And in some ways, I'm happy that I'm beginning to increasingly think, is that a space we want to train women? And we learned this through our efforts to train women in party politics. We working together with development partners and, and governments outside Botswana, we together with more than several others, wanted to respond to a, a concern that um, among other people in this room, Gretchen Bauer raised about whether women in Botswana have stopped talking. Um, no, women remain talking in Botswana. But what does that um, talking um, bring about in terms of political um, party leadership and being in those structures? is that there's no direct relationship. So in Botswana, for instance, you find that women are becoming leaders in non-politics spaces. Um, Botswana is in the, one of the top 10, and there were some statistics from um, a trusted source that the, it's one of the top 10 countries where your leader or your boss is likely to be a woman. 
just outside parliament, do, do not look at parliament, do, look at, do not look at political office, but leadership is something that women in Botswana do and do very well. Just this morning, um, the former um, attorney general of Botswana, who's now an ambassador of Botswana in Sweden, has been appointed as um, chair of one of the WTO working groups, i.e. we lead. Um, and I don't think when you compare men and women in Botswana, the women that have left leadership beyond, that have gone into leadership beyond national borders, there's more women that have, that are leading in strategic even development partnership spaces outside Botswana. So leadership in women in Botswana is not um, water and oil. So why is it that in party politics, it's not taking place? It is because party politics um, in Botswana are, in my view, the quickest access to um, what we call tenderpreneurship. Um, so that there's a saying, it's our time to eat. And very soon after people have been elected, they now have private companies that very quickly win government tenders. So it's, it's a space that, and then we continue to complain Claim that um, policies are not working. However, when you look at the women's movement and what it has done, more than any other movement and fast being overtaken by the LGBTQ movement, it has been able to get more laws changed in favor of women. Of course, the changing of um, laws in itself does not translate to transformation in that sort of quick sense, but um, it, it is an achievement that um, we enjoy. So I and Maud went into the space imagining that perhaps what women lacked, we're coming from the academia and there had been a narrative that maybe women lacked training. And so we went into that space to find, to team up with people with the relevant training to share it with women. We called it, let's say, Magat Initiative. Let's say, it's a Sazana word for um, sharecropping um, and just women or communities working together on one person's um, doing one one of the members of the community you would work together with them in their field or whatever work that they need to be that needs to be done and then you move to the next person and so forth and so on until the team has moved around the different team members um, needs and so but it opened us opened eyes for us to actually meet women that have been in the political space for as long as party politics um, yeah. emerged in Botswana. Women have always been, women in Botswana have always been in party politics. Mm -hmm. The narrative that culture in Botswana um, or cultures, we know women are, they conform to culture and they, they find part, political party space to be um, a space they can't fit in. A lot of political leaders, if not all of the people, the men that win it in parliament will tell you that they would not have made it without a strong <laughs> women's team. Absolutely. Are, uh, working long nights, um, coming home at 4 a.m., women politicians in Botswana do that. Mm -hmm. But as Gretchen Bauer is, um, has done some very good work on what is it, it is about um, inter lack of internal party democracy yeah. that then often when it comes to putting up women as candidates, not that women candidates have proven to be any weaker. Women candidates in Botswana, where they have been given an opportunity, have done exceedingly well. Mm -hmm. Even when they don't win a position, it's never like a thing of 100 versus zero votes. They, they, they lose with um, respectable margins, just like other men could, could lose, could win. And so what we learned from trying to train them is that they know more than we do. And that <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And that they have agency in that space. Mm. They are not just there for the song and the fundraising. They do actually have a lot of agency and that women that are in political party spaces mm. also tend to, to have greater chances of mobilizing resources, networking, and becoming more community involved, but also even in terms of their own um, commercial, um, you know, informal sector uh, businesses, they are able to, to, to network with others to improve their own um, livelihoods. So there's a lot that the political space environment offers for women that does not necessarily simply translate to a vote. Mm. 
Mm, absolutely, some really important points there. I, I could go on asking many questions from the points that you've raised. I'm, I'm anxious to give everybody a chance to speak and we have many questions coming in. So thank you very much on that little insight um, for, for your book. Um, if I could turn um, to the case of Malawi, um, Asiata As Chueza, um, I hope you can hear, hear correctly. Are you there? Yeah. Perfect. Yes, Hi. Hi. <laughs> let, let me ask you, um, you have a case from Malawi on party primary candidate nomination institutions. And what would be some of the key points you would like to add into this debate um, about informality in particular, um, um, women's candidature in parliamentary elections? Yeah, thank you very much, Elena. And I also would like to say thank you very much to Diana for coordinating this uh, particular project. It was quite an experience, but worth it. I would like to say that uh, this particular contribution is speaking to the puzzle that is in Malawi. And the puzzle is about um, a 50-50 funding campaign that Malawi has been uh, doing from 2009 to the 2019 elections. So the funding campaign was actually geared towards supporting women so that they can then stand as uh, viable candidates during the elections. But what happened is that uh, in 2009, uh, the representation rate was 22%. Then 2014, it went down to 16%. 2019, it just shot up, but very in, in a small way to 23%. So the question has been, what is wrong? What is going on? And yet there's this support that women are actually getting. So it, very briefly, I'm basically showing that I think when we go to the mental level, there's actually a lot that's happening that's affecting women. Yes, the money is important, but there's quite a lot. So in this chapter, I'm actually showing how the informality during the party primary election processes has been an entrenched systemic issue in, in Malawi that's actually affecting women's entry into parliament. So it's at, at that level where uh, the number of candidates is actually uh, sifted. Because in Malawi, you can stand as an independent candidate, but also as a candidate under a particular party. But most people prefer to stand as candidates uh, on a particular party, because I think the chances of winning are higher when you're standing as a party candidate. So what I'm basically bringing out here is that the formal rules that actually talk about eligibility of parliamentary candidates, such as the constitution, you know, the election rules, uh, they talk about the eligibility, yes, but they leave political parties to choose their own nomination methods and the rules for selecting their candidates. So when you go down to what's happening on the ground, you find that the political parties they will say that they have rules, but none of the parties has a written outline of these rules. Mm -hmm. Now to them, they say this is formal, okay? But if you look at the definitions of uh, institutionalism, feminist institutionalism, it, it's only formal when they are written down, mm -hmm. but they will say they are rules. So these rules, although they are not written in any party document, but they are communicated orally, and they are also enforced inside the officially sanctioned channels, like from the national executive of the party to the regional, to the district and so on. So what is happening in practice is that there's a dissonance between these orally handed down rules and the practice on the ground. So you find that aspiring candidates do not have access to the entire set of rules until maybe closer to the time of the actual primary elections. And some candidates don't even have the information at all. The rules are usually disregarded as elites push for their favored candidates. So I found that there are three main forms of these informal practices. So when you go to any party elite, they'll, they'll tell you we have the rules. But on the ground, there are three main forms of informal practices which they are using. The first one is this um, informality around the selection and identification of the delegates or the selectors. So there's no clear definition in terms of who is the eligible delegate to vote, but also there's no clear mechanism for identifying and certifying the delegate. 
So what happens is that the elites, they manipulate that process and maybe last minute, they bring in new delegates on the voting day to favor their preferred candidates. The second uh, informal, informal way is the scheduling of time, date, and venue for the primary election. Very interesting, you know? So they usually do not disclose the information on venues and, you know, schedule times. And they also have all these sudden unilateral changes of venues so that ultimately, if they have a candidate that they want to favor, that candidate will have the information. The others will not have the information until maybe late in the night, a day before the primary elections. So what has come out very clearly is that through these tactics, you know, in political parties, there are kind of strategies, you know, of male political networks. Many women end up losing the primaries and others actually decide to stand as independent candidates. I'll give you an example. In the 2019 elections, 117 out of the 309, that's about 39% of the women stood as independent candidates. And then the third mechanism of informality is around the results approval processes. So you have cases where a woman, you know, is declared a winner at a primary candidate election process. But the final submission of the names to the electoral commission will carry a different name altogether, yet the woman um, actually won. So uh, in short, basically what I'm trying to say is that uh, beyond just looking at maybe the, the resources that the women have, but there are all these you know, informal tactics within the parties simply because the rules mm -hmm. are not documented. They are not articulated. They are all oral rules and they can easily be uh, manipulated. And this is heavily affecting even the number of uh, women that are coming up to stand Mm. as candidates uh, during the parliamentary uh, election. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. A really um, interesting insight into the, the informal practices that are taking place. And a real strength of the book as a whole is, is in the comparison and the documentation, the really rich nuance of these informal practices that are taking place across um, the continent. Um, Catherine Marlow, if I could turn to you, you've written um, Inspiring a Revolution, Women's Central Role in Tanzanian Institutions, Independence and Beyond. Um, and it did occur to me when reading this uh, chapter, or rereading it actually, uh, for, for this uh, seminar that it has a, an unplanned topicality uh, with, with the new head of state in Tanzania, but uh, I don't know whether you agree with me. <laughs> um, but anyway, you, you start your chapter by highlighting a pattern that women and their contributions are distorted and pushed to the margins. And I'm very keen to hear from you, particularly in light of the new head of state in actual fact, um, what you'd highlight as some of the key messages coming out of your chapter. Um, so to start, I mean, I think that it is important to acknowledge that the president, John Magafuli, he, he passed away only a week ago, eight days ago, um, on March 17th, and the new president came to power only on March 19th. Um, and it is, a, she was the vice president and she is a woman. Um, and so we can, I still think that the things that we've talked about are very relevant. And of course, Tanzania has a system of, um, of um, quotas, right? And and it also has a system where if the president is Christian, the vice president must be Muslim, right? And so the vice president was Muslim, but I'll, I'm gonna turn it over to Marla in a second, but I think that it's very appropriate that the first vice president is a Muslim woman and the woman that we speak about, BBTT Mohammed, also was a Muslim woman. Um, and we talk a lot about the idea of representation in some of our other work and having that representation being so critical. Um, I loved what um, Josephine said about this idea of like all of this, um, uh, you know, these policies that are put in place in order to get women into power is really starting from the point of women being lacking. And in fact, as a historian who does early African history, pre-colonial African history, you see so many examples of women, in fact, actually being leaders. Um, and so like there's something that is happening in the colonial period that um, takes away the agency from women. So I'll turn it over to Marla and we can say more. 
Hello. It's maybe unfair of me to, to ask you about the present context. I know that isn't what your chapter was on, so please, uh, please uh, go with the messages that your yeah. chapter is with you. No, that's fine. Uh, it really does, I think, link up really well with what we, you know, set out to talk about in this in this chapter, which in some ways um, gets to the arguments that others are making about um, what constitutions cannot do, um, what some of these other policies and practices set out to do but have been unable to achieve um, by addressing in our uh, chapter um, the role of African feminist theoretical positions um, and how important they are to the informal, to the symbolic. And um, we, we really conclude our chapter by looking at the ways in which um, everyday women have exerted their political power less through um, the, the, the traditional political mechanisms, but through other forms such as um, conga cloth um, as a feminist political intervention, as a historical and political archive, as a way for women to carve out their own subjectivity, to demonstrate their authority, um, as to, to, to serve as a form of provocation and political education. And I think, you know, one of the arguments that we make is that when we lose that history, when we lose that knowledge um, or dismiss it as being lesser than, this also influences um, you know, whether young girls and women get involved in, in politics, if they can't see themselves as ever being there or being effective. And, and, and as other speakers have mentioned, it's not a lack of political will, and it's also not even a lack of political success, but rather how these stories are told um, and through what mechanisms they're told um, and the ways in which, <clears throat> excuse me, these, these, these distortions um, have a rippling effect. So for instance, in Tanzania, as Simone had mentioned, you know, there is a, a, an equality focused constitution. And at least and since 1985, there is a reserved seat quota system. But as several authors um, have mentioned, um, it's an opaque process. Mm -hmm. um, the ways in which these seats um, are assigned based on the number of party votes, um, and they have their own processes uh, for allocating these seats um, that um, aren't really aren't really known. And so we have that on one end of the spectrum, and then we talk about the specific example of Bibi Titi Mohammed, who, despite the the lack of political education, a family of influence, her own education, her identity as a as a wife and a mother. Um, as a Muslim woman um, rises through the ranks and does so much to mobilize so many men and women both, um, but she pays a political cost for this, right? And so it follows through a particular kind of narrative in which women who have agency and are politically ambitious um, will be oftentimes um, sexualized, um, ridiculed, right? The level of misogyny and patriarchy isn't disrupted. In fact, it is used against her um, to criminalize and then punish her. Now, to sort of circle back to what's happening at this moment, um, you know, we have uh, Samia Sulu Hassan, a 61-year-old Muslim woman, the first president born of the semi-autonomous island Zanzibar. She becomes the sixth president, um, but, she, but her first speech um, that she makes when she lets the country know that the president has died, um, she essentially has to assert, right? For those who, and I quote her in her own words, for those who have doubts that this woman will be able to be president of the United States or the United Republic of Tanzania, I would like to say that this person standing here is the president. I would like to repeat, this person standing here is the president of the United Republic of Tanzania. I happen to be a woman. 
And so what's exciting about Hassan's story is that she has a noted history of activism and she has been working extensively as a member of civil society prior, prior to her um, work as, you know, or her election as, as vice president. So while she doesn't have the patronage of other politicians based on her intersectional identity and the exclusiveness of male dominated homosocial politics in Tan uh, Tanzania, there is a promise in this abrupt change, um, especially given the rollback of rights, the media censorship, the political party repression and state violence, not to mention the particularly virulent misogyny and sexism that was rampant in Magafuli's leadership, right? He, he was known to specifically call out women and girls um, and denigrate them. Um, we, we see this moment, but I think if we're not, again, centering on African feminist work and that work that typically exists in Tanzania at the grassroots level, right? If we're to see a model of what a feminist institutionalism could look like, it would exist in those spaces, right? Not in other political spaces, I would argue, where we argue, right? And that the traditional sphere of politics is, go is a constant work in progress. Um, and that we argue um, African feminist theories, right? Theories that center women and girls as subjects, as agents, right? Not just as victims or as recipients of rights, but that have the, this agency that pre-exists um, and it, it challenges an epistemic violence that occurs when there's a one size fits all approach to inclusion, political inclusion. Um, and that this African feminist work is deeply intersectional, right? It, 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 it holds so much complexity, which I think so many institutions and so many of these discussions that we're having today reveal, but oftentimes are flattened out and represented as a one size fits all, right? So highlighting the complexity and channel, cha challenging universalizing approaches to women, uh, to trans women, to gender non-conforming um, people, people who uh, are feminine presenting, right? And that's situated in this kind of practice that we see um, feminist grassroots organizers um, in, and leaders in Tanzania um, exemplifying, right? So those theories about how women are oppressed and the experiences um, in gaining equity come from those spaces, right? So not some imagined top down, but a, a bottom up. So um, and just to yeah, add on to that, that this is what I was starting to say is that we would we still do think that um, the argument that we make applies, even though um, Hassan has become president, right? Because on the one hand, you have quotas and they do do something, but they're not doing all of the work that needs to be done. Um, and women are also doing all of this other work. Um, and so basically we're suggesting that a more expansive approach to looking at the work that women are doing and thinking about also a pipeline of how do you get women into these quota systems? Um, because it did take, it would have taken Hassan uh, if she would have become president after Magafuli, which would have been five years from now because he was just reelected four months ago, um, you know, she would have waited 30 years since the time she entered politics, whereas men have basically spent anywhere between one and 15 years essentially moving through the ranks of the party system. So that's, I think that yes, we need quotas, but they're not enough and they don't do all the work. And we shouldn't think that the countries that have quotas, and there's a lot of great questions from the audience about this idea of, you know, which kinds of, which countries are using quotas and which ones aren't, um, in terms of like, does it actually, it's it's symbolic, but does it, is it meaningful always? So, yeah. yeah thank you, really, really pertinent points. Um, and particularly uh, that you all, underlining the the need to challenge universalizing approaches as well i think very important part for the conversation again i could go on asking you many questions i'm very anxious to leave time for for the audience so thank you very much um sheila if i could maybe turn to you um and you bring an interesting dimension to the picture in terms of 
of um, legislation and the legislative aspects, which I, I thought was a, a slightly different angle to some of the other papers. In your chapter on experiences of gender equality in legislation in Kenya and the role of institutions and actors, what, what sort of key points that you would add to this very rich picture that is being built up by your co-authors? Okay, thanks, Elena, and uh, thanks everyone for having me and uh, for the team with whom we co-authored this book, and of course to Diana for editing. Well, so I'll try to be fast because my, my son is not being very cooperative today. Oh, I'm sorry, please, um, don't worry. <laughs> I, <can't. laughs> no, I, I, I just forced his dad to take another round with him in the blog. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, my research, uh, this was part of my uh, PhD research, which focuses on the experiences of gender equality legislation among Kenyans in the post-2010 uh, political framework when we had the new constitution. And uh, of course, uh, it's not just in the process of drafting the constitution that the whole issue of gender justice was being discussed in Kenya. It was, it, it's been a long, I mean, I say it, it's, it's been a long discussion because I mean, it's still ongoing because um, for anyone who's following this, um, we still haven't, even though it's there in the constitution, we still haven't been able to realize uh, this uh, the two, I mean, the one third, well, it's a two thirds gender rule, but we haven't yet managed to have even a third of women uh, in legislature. And so um, my research was just looking at fine. I mean, this, this has been a journey, which now that we have it in the constitution is we could say successful that we finally have the rules. We are finally going to get gender justice. And uh, for the longest time, it, I mean, not, not for the longest time, for the, I, I would say for the first two, three years, it seemed so because uh, we uh, women celebrated that finally this thing we've been championing has been made law, so it's going to happen. Uh, but one of the things that already pointed to a possibility of this thing becoming even more problematic was the fact that there was no mechanism of how then are we going to realize this? So of course this thing goes to court and they settle on progressive realization, whatever that may be. And uh, so I just thought, well, that, that's, that, that's, that's a very high level thing. So let me look at the realities of everyday life. How are people uh, relating with these rules? How are they uh, accepting of them or not? What are the mechanisms in place to ensure that women actually get engaged? Because it's not just in legislature, not just in uh, political seats. It's also a thing that's supposed to be implemented in decision-making processes. So we're looking at budgeting processes as well. And that was the core of my research. And of course, I took a case study approach. I focused on the Maasai community because, you know, it was a PhD and I had the uh, pleasure of choosing where I wanted to do it. And I chose my community because I understand how problematic, you know, gender relations are. And then here comes a rule that, you know, well, yeah, things might be as they are because they are as they are. You have your own social cultural way of doing things. But you know we are under a nation state, and this is how we'd like for things to go. So then I was very curious to understand how do these sort of uh, two levels of institutional directives uh, relate. And uh, as I highlight here, it's uh, it's very much a case of resistance. To, to be quite honest, of course there's there's, there's an uptick uh, when you're looking at the formal aspect of it, of um, the the men and women working for government who are mandated with ensuring that this uh, gender equality is adhered to, they do try. Whether they are fully committed to it is uh, uh, questionable, but they do try to, to, to like have the mechanisms in place. Of course, you have issues of funding, which they also present as the main issue why it's very difficult to bring more women on board in decision-making. So I, was, I, I decided to just check then Institution, uh, institutional mechanisms aside, how are people relating with this? And uh, it was very much a case of men, and I say men, of course, not all women were very much for this because they are very, uh, their women were very much okay with the status quo because they, they find that, uh, I, I think Sechuni has pointed out, the political processes don't, don't really support the inclusion of women anyway because I don't have the time to be, uh, the pleasure to be out at 8 p.m. campaigning or doing whatever. So it's fine, it, whatever, if I can, I will participate. If not, well and good. But, so you, but then you have a lot of men who are resistant to this because essentially, at least from the, from the discussions I had with them, they feel like the state is telling them that, hey, you're doing something wrong. 
And of course, when someone is telling you you're doing something wrong, the, the most obvious thing to do is being defensive. Mm -hmm. So, and that is one of the things that I highlight that there wasn't really much, uh, and it's actually a critic that has been fronted to the whole debate on gender equality in Kenya. It was not a debate that really included people at the grassroots as much as it could have because, uh, but I mean, and it is understa understandable that you have people in academia and in research and in politics and activists in general pushing for this. But then nobody took a lot of effort to make men and women at the local level understand that, you know, gender justice does not mean that, you know, men, you've had power for a very long time, now step aside, it's time for women. Because then what you have now is conflicts because men feel like, A, well, it's a two third gender rule. So what you're essentially telling me is there could be a time where women will be more than men and they might decide that that's the time to seek revenge. And that's a position we do not want to find ourselves in. So those are the mechanisms I explore in my work. And uh, I, as I conclude in the end, you know, we, we might have these very wonderful uh, laws in place, uh, quota systems all very well laid out. You know, you can have structures in place and you can have directives in place. You can have everything in place. Mm. But if social culturally speaking, people are not in the journey, then that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And what this also uh, creates room for is for disregard for uh, institutions in general, because at this point in time, at the last time we were discussing gender equality in Kenya and the, in the, this two thirds gender rule, I mean, the, the, the point was that, look, we cannot force people to vote, to vote for women. So it's been 10 years now, we haven't found a solution regardless of the many formulas that have been uh, proposed. So maybe this thing is actually not realistic. And what was being proposed is that, well, maybe we need to change the constitution because we cannot render the parliament uh, unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is actually change the constitution so that this, this requirement is no longer there. And then, you know, it continues as business as usual. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how the future of uh, gender equality uh, debate in Kenya goes because so far it's very, it's, it's difficult to tell where we are headed, mm -hmm. uh, legally speaking at least. But um, not that everything is all gloomy. Of course, people see the benefit of having women on board. Um, but of course, the biggest problem we've had is that a lot of women who get into power are women who are related to who's who as, as far as men in politics is concerned. And you see that a lot in the women representatives being uh, voted into uh, the, the Senate and the, what we have as a, the top up uh, gender quotas for women at the county assemblies. So yeah, I think that's it. It's a very, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, outlook into just how these things play out in what you could call the daily, the lived reality, exactly. you know, of yeah. gender, and, and, gender, gender practice. And the practices that are in place and become reinforced, and how hard it is to change these practices. Maybe if your son will permit us, uh, before before you go, I know I know he, he he's anxious for you. Um, could I just ask you one question from the audience, which I I know that you you're keen to answer. Um, when the world talks about people, whether women or men, that always focuses on the physical man. The spirit man is ignored. It is the spirit man which implements things, which runs the world self-esteem confidence maturity could be our limitations in exerting our presence in the political space as women I know you would like to comment on this so please well yeah I did, I did see that and I thought I actually wanted to start answering um yeah the, I but I, I I do not agree about the competence and maturity I think at this point in history, women have the maturity and the competence to actually take on political affairs and, you know, not just in office, but actually influence political discourse in whatever setup. Um, and uh, I find the, 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 the mention of the spirit man very interesting because then we, we talk about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And, and yeah, it, it is true that, you know, you know, there's the law as written that, you know, these are the rules of engagement as far as gender equality is concerned. But are, is, are we committed to actually doing it? And then, of course, we tie this to respect for institutions. And that's where the issues come in. Where does the disrespect come in? How are we able to 
talk about you know people not respecting the letter of the law people not respecting the institutional mechanisms that have been uh, laid out and i think it's this whole thing of um like uh should i well if I, I i am not a man but if i assume i am a man if a thing doesn't stand to benefit me i'm really not committed i'm not going to commit to it if it threatens my status i'm not going to commit to it and then if i find myself in an environment where there don't seem to be any consequences whether I commit to this thing or not, then it's just not going to happen. And I think that's the biggest problem we have, at least in the Kenyan context, is that the laws are in place, mechanisms, uh, realistic or not as they may be, are there. But there's, it's just it just seems to be, you know, we, we did this because, you know, it's part of a global discourse, you know, we changed our constitution because, you know, we, we have everything, like the constitution is not just about gender equality, but we have everything as perfectly as can be, constitutionally speaking, but whether that is actually being followed is, is, is something else altogether. So it's the thing of, we do this because that's been done, we want to be on the right side of, of history and be seen to be doing everything right, whether it's tied to uh, donor funding and everything, that's another debate, but we really not, because we are not really, I mean, we are, we are fine, because when you're looking at the political class, it's really just a very small, group of people and families mm. so it's not really changed so the only people who get who manage to get into this cocoon of the political class are people who mm. have to pledge allegiance so they're not mm. uh, what's, what's what i'm looking for so change is not really something that you could say they are really committed to you know and then you mm. get into this yeah, whole quality whole discussion of people get in you know people are activists get into politics get into political uh, appointments but then then ch they change then what happens when they get into this place mm. so yeah the 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 spirit uh, <laughs> what, what what does it say the body is willing but the spirit is or the spirit is willing but the body is weak in this case it could be the body is willing but uh, the spirit is a uh, Thank you very much, Sheila. Yes, really pertinent points. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to uh, turn to Monica now, but um, Mandita, I know you were cut off very short. If you would like to add something after I've spoken to Monica, do please turn your video on and then I'll know to turn to you. Um, Monica, last but not least, I absolutely assure you, thank you for waiting patiently. Um, you, you're writing about women's political representation and institutionalism in Nigeria. Nigeria, what in your view is an insight that we can add to from a historical perspective to the various points that have been made so far? Thank you. I want to just say a big thank you to Diana for having me on board and also to Amanda. I remember the roots or the seed for this book was the planted in Stellenbosch in a conference on IFSA in, I think, 2017. So Amanda, thank you there. So much has been done in terms of um, women political representation in Nigeria, but the concern majorly why this uh, work was done is the fact that as much as we try over the years, especially since the beginning of the democratic rule, the number of women in, police, in politics has increasingly reduced. And presently, what we have today is nothing to write home about in Nigeria when compared to other African countries. countries. So this in itself was a concern for me. So, what happened was that in a bit to try to explain some of the reason or the reason for this, we still had what we had, maybe because of um, the cultural reason, the norms, religious uh, bias against women, patriarchy, the normal reasons you want to give. But beyond that, I saw that we could also trace the history of how women have come about in terms of uh, being in position of leadership over the years. So we trace this work traced 
how women have been in position of leadership, their participation in uh, politics from the pre-colonial period, the uh, colonial period and present day. Actually, this study is influenced by the feminist historical institutionalism to explore the participation of women in decision-making in governance. And like I said, from different period in the history of Nigeria, the pre-colonial, colonial and the post-colonial. Women's political representation to date uh, is such that initially women were part of uh, the decision making that's following from history. During the pre colonial period, women were there as a supporter in terms of a financial supporter in the home until the colonial period when things actually uh, changed. From the findings of the study, the history of the institutional framework that have been in place in Nigeria over time played a key role, a key role in shaping the level of um, women representation in decision-making such that we have today. And drawing from the writings of uh, state production and reproduction of uh, unequal gender and class relationship. This study shows that the Nigerian state does not relate to all people in the same way, that is equally. And as far as it relates to women at all, it tends to treat women as quantitatively aberrant and qualitatively uh, homogeneous. The study went on further to establish that institutions do matter in determining women representation in politics in Nigeria. And for the period under review, institutions play a major role in the present low level of women in a uh, political arena, rather. Also, the finding from this work indicates that the present power play between men and women and the political arena is a product of historical development of the state. And like I, as well as, as a cultural and institutional framework that has been, in, has been put in place over time. The idea concept of what the traditional conception of the role of women should be actually changed drastically during the colonial era. And it was it, and this obstructed the itato existing structures that was on ground before. So much evidence where also uh, this work also shared um, shed light on the fact that from a, a historical perspective, women have been in the forefront, representing women interests as a uh, warriors as traders and economic powers, in addition to their role in the household as wives and mother from the beginning, like I said earlier, and to date, structures of inequality, though existed in the pre-colonial times, no doubt, they were however heightened and institutionalized as new legal structures under the colonial rule. And with the creation of colonial econo economy, rather, the creation of the colonial econo economy dur during the colonial era marginalized the position of the majority of women. And there was evidence that existing institutional framework did not favor women in their political representation, thus perpetuating their low representation. Also, this work shed light more on the experiences of women in leadership under the military rule. It may interest us that looking at the historical background under the military rule, there was no woman in position of power 
during the military era. The structure of the military has uh, made it diffi very difficult for women to be part of the Supreme Military Council and the later Armed Forces Ruling Council. In the military, we have various commissions and out of the commissions that we have, various commissions, for example, we have uh, the regular combat uh, commission, combatant commission, we have the so, a short service competent commission. We have the direct regular commission and we have the direct short service and executive commission. The regular competent commission is the only commission that can give an officer the opportunity to aspire to head any of the, to head any of the services or even rise to become the chief of defense staff. Why the others have limited career paths? However, female officers in the Nigerian Armed Forces, irrespective of their competencies or skills, have always been limited to non-combatant duties. And we know the, what this means, thereby limiting their career paths for attaining higher posts. And this is what has been in ground. Although in Nigeria, the training of female cadets only started in 2011, and by 2017, this was revised back. Important. It was phased out. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So, with this, the chances of a woman becoming Nigeria chief of armed, armed forces, of mm -hmm. army staff, or a member of the Supreme Military Council mm -hmm. is close, is mm -hmm. close. And for a long period, we know Nigeria was under the military rule. And this was a major setback mm -hmm. for representation of uh, women mm -hmm. in Nigeria. And uh, they're, just they're, to they're, have, very, they're very critical points about how you have institutions perpetuating the exclusion of women. Very, very important points you're raising. Yes, and presently, in a Thank quick you. one before I just stop here, Hmm. Presently, the monetization of uh, politics in Nigeria does not uh, help uh, female or women participation in politics uh, hmm. in Nigeria. That is also another uh, uh, long um, story to tell yes. concerning um, participation of women in Nigeria. Hmm. Monica, thank you. Really interesting uh, points that you're raising that apply to many contexts, but obviously have their own particular institutional nuance within, within the Nigerian context. Um, I'm very anxious to uh, have time to, to have some of the questions from the audience. Mandiza, you were, thank you very much. Mandiza, you were cut off. Um, if I could ask you to be brief, please, but uh, you were making some really interesting points about Zimbabwe earlier when your internet was cut. Thank you very much, Elena. I was saying, I, I, I'm not going to greet or thank anybody as I've already done that. I, I said my focus was on Joyce Mujuru because she was the only female that was consistently in Mugabe's cabinet of ministers since independence until her fallout in um, 2013. My focus really is on the representation of female politicians in Zimbabwe by the media. And my general analysis in terms of conclusions was that Media, media represents women as inadequate or inferior to male uh, politicians in Zimbabwe. For instance, just to give an example, you find that uh, Mugabe, whether it was in the mainline newspapers or tabloids, was constantly uh, referred to as Mutunga Wenyika in my language or head of state, while Joyce Mujuru was uh, often just called my, which means mother in my language, instead of deputy uh, president or vice president of the country, if it was supposed to be consistent with what Mugabe was called, which means there was the way in which the media constructs uh, female politicians to relegate them to the domestic sphere. So gender stereotypes, particularly for female politicians, do not fall easily, but continue to pose challenges for 
women in Zimbabwe. And these are constructs that are embedded in patriarchy. So my, the double dilemma for me was a cash 22 for female politicians. And in its application to Joyce Mujuru, you find that Joyce Mujuru has, has a distilling um, political career from the liberation struggle to post-liberation. And she was consistently in the parliament up to 2013. But you still find the way she's represented in the media leaves a lot to be desired. And what is also unfortunate about her appointment, particularly in 2005, was received with mixed feelings, both from the women and from um, the men, because at that point also, there were agitations and protests from women, particularly from civil organizations, that women are not being included in politics and they wanted answers. And therefore, Mujuru was appointed at that time, which made it uh, easy for her to be the target of females. Let me say women that were disgruntled about that appointment because they also felt it was on a party or patronage basis. Just taking into consideration that when you look at Joyce Mujuru, she was the wife of General Mujuru, who was also instrumental in the liberation struggle and after independence in the army. And you also know the interconnectivity of politics and uh, the military within Africa, them determining who comes into power. And these power relations continue to play until probably predictably around 2013. You find that Mujuru was killed in a very controversial manner. He was actually bent in his house. And it has never been decided what caused the fire. Just after his demise, Mujuru was demoted. We go back to the issue of um, formal institutions as far as quota systems were concerned because Mugabe consistently appointed Mujuru whether she won from her constituents or not, which pointed, or let me say, gave leeway for critics to say probably it was not on meritorious basis, but it was based on patronage within the party politics. And then you also see another dynamic around the current president who was also angling for power for a long time. And Mugabe was playing power politics. This is what other critics and scholars say for Zimbabwe. And then when um, she was appointed, critics also just said she was appointed because she became a weaker opposition to Mugabe than E.G. Mnangagwa, who was posing challenges to the president, to wanting to be president at that moment. Mm. And therefore, all these issues continued to play out in the media. Despite the fact, of course, that you also realize that Mujuru had done a lot of contributions, particularly political, what was probably missing hmm. within Mujuru probably was her adequate representation of women in Zimbabwe, which continued to follow her, which makes it very easy when hmm. Mugabe was in 2013. And this politics was also played out within the media. And unfortunately also for women, because patriarchy is embedded, they used another woman to oust Mujuru, who was actually the former president's wife. Grace continued. It's Olympic complicated, Olympic. isn't it? <laughs> and also on uh, Joyce Mujuru, yeah. calling her a baby, slandering her in the media, and mm -hmm. this was very deliberate because it, if it had been done by another man, they mm -hmm. were going to be accused of harassment. And you find that for me, as far as African feminist thought is concerned, mm -hmm. we need to start to think about non-universalization of feminist thought because for us, even if um, women can act against other women, but also being used by the major political mm. uh, elements within political parties, which mm. is quite common, particularly for Zimbabwe, mm. especially with the power of quota system. The person that appoints you can demote you at whatever time they want, because it was actually before her term had ended, she was actually ousted out of power and women were used to actually slander her, and her political career was also cut short. <laughs> and, um, 
when you look at the situation now, like every other speaker has intimated before, you find that we've got very beautiful, well-constructed constitutions as far as women representation in terms of numbers is concerned. Mm. But in terms of implementation, yes. no one follows it up. Mm. It's really up to the person at the helm to mm. appoint or not appoint at a given time. Even mm. in peace um, agreements, you find that you can have just one women, woman within a peace agreement and several men who are going to decide the way forward, which continues to be very problematic, particularly for Zimbabwe. And therefore, even when you look at my paper within the book, you find that consistently there was this issue about the media referring to Njuru on familial terms. Yeah. yeah. Making her yeah. inadequate or less of less value to mm. President Mugabe because they called her my, which in my language, point to motherhood or wifehood or mother of children mm. until the end of her career, which mm. leaves a lot desire to, a lot to, des to desire and also does not inspire the younger females who want to be in politics because of that kind of representation. Mm. Mm. And therefore consistently Mujuru was referred as inferior. And it is at the language is at the center of this kind of representation as far as women in politics in Zimbabwe are concerned. And mm. also, I think, just lastly, to, to really uh, show um, how this played out, media continued to be very instrumental in filtration processes from primary elections until women are actually in parliament which continues mm -hmm. to disadvantage women up to this day. So mm -hmm. generally, or let me say in summary, this was what my uh, chapter within the book was about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A really uh, interesting case. I, I found that the, the new and the learning that can come um, from that particular case. Thank you very much for interesting. Um, maybe I'd like to, open it up um, to the panel just to let's take a couple of questions from the, from the audience um, what, and I, I'll do some old chestnuts here. Um, how can equality be achieved in the adoption process for different types of women, um, the women youth in particular? Any, any thoughts on this question? I know it's a long running debate. Would anyone like to comment? Can you repeat what, I'm sorry. Yeah, one of the questions from the audience, um, how, how, how can equality be achieved in the adoption process for different types of women? And in particular, thinking about women youth and bringing women youth into the political process. Maybe I can but, but, say something. I, mean, I, I think it's, it's a very relevant question because I mean, we also need to think about not just women, and political representation, but also in terms of uh, which women and other intersecting categories. And uh, clearly age is one of those. I mean, there are very few young women in politics, but I can say for the Ghana case that with the recent elections, there's actually been a slight increase, but from a very low point in uh, younger women and the uh, thing is that some of these women are there i think mainly become because they come from political families mm -hmm. so they have kind of been politically educated from home and they are also prepared uh, to enter politics which is a quite hostile and misogynist space for women in in ghana in many ways where a kind of politics of insults, ridicule, and rumors are in place working against uh, more women in political office. But generally, I think there's a need to put more spotlight into analysis of, you know, intersecting uh, categories. Uh, I also know that uh, Sheila, for example, uh, analyzed in terms of especially ethnicity and also has some reflections on age, mm -hmm. I think. Thank you very much. Uh, and another general question, which is long running debates, what can we do to help women build influence and earn their right in the space without being given special treatment? Is there anybody else who'd like to respond to this question? 
Please well, think of, the, of this idea that quotas or targets for women are special treatment. Mm -hmm. um, that's always an argument to, to delegitimize quotas. But if you have a 30% quota for women, you have a 70% quota for women. So who looks at the men's qualifications and the men's merit to be uh, political leaders? And, and I think that's, you know, the feminist argument is that uh, this, this argument about merit is that it, it, it is just a way to delegitimize uh, quotas, but without quotas. Mm will not get in. The, the, those rules that are sort of being designed by the patriarchal, in patriarchal systems are not beneficial to women. So we've seen the difference in countries where quotas have been accepted. Um, uh, even if they cannot lead to substantive representation, they do, if, if you have committed or what's called critical actors, um, they, they actually contribute significantly to, to um, put some issues on the agenda and, and make, you know, at least some women's issues visible. So, you know, it is not special treatment. Thank you, Amanda, a really important point, and thank you for, for making it. I'm going to ask one um, final question for anyone in the panel who might like to answer. Does presence of several political parties in a country help unite women's voices? <laughs> Who would like to take that question? I know, Diana, I know that you, you the Ghana case is uh, very relevant, but is there someone else who would like to take the question? I mean, I'm just gonna like Please. Tanzania doesn't really have a, it kind of has a multi-party system, but there's really only one party that ever wins. But I think by looking at other countries, I don't think that a multi-party system necessarily unifies women's voices, but I do think it creates more spaces for women's voices. Mm -hmm. So it might amplify it in some ways, but I don't think it necessarily unifies it. Yeah, I do I do agree with that because um, I think in most cases when you have multiple parties at play, it's all about the issues being discussed. And then the, the more women we have in the platform because of the various political parties then can rally around the issue but as far as uh, unifying, I, I would just say it's more issue based. Yeah. Then the okay. more women you have, uh, the more parties you have, the more uh, you know voices are added to the issues at hand. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Um, can I can I also just say something from the Malawi experience? Um, very, 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 very. One second, please, <laughs> and then I'm going to yes. hand over to Diana. <laughs> okay. Please. Yeah, I would like to say that having a lot of parties does not necessarily unify. The women's um, agenda in Malawi, we have a lot of parties, and we have what is known as the women's caucus, where you have uh, representatives from all these parties. Actually, what happens is that if they have an agenda in the women's caucus, ultimately, when they are making decisions in parliament, the women will actually toe the party line because there's party discipline within the parties. So, ultimately, they will take the party line and not the unified agenda that's from the party caucus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to all our panelists for the many uh, comments and uh, points that you've raised and which we could have had a much longer debate on. I appreciate. And also for the questions from the audience, uh, which uh, I can see there's some great questions in there, very, very juicy, uh, nice to see. And I'm sorry that I haven't had a chance to turn to them all. I'd like to just turn to Diana um, to give some closing words now, please. But uh, thank you very much from me, Diana. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Eleanor. And uh, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, uh, Josephine, thank you for the very uh, interesting, elaborate and uh, comments about the book and I would also like to thank all the authors for all your commitment and enthusiasm and all your positive comments uh, throughout 2020 when we were working with this book. Uh, it was quite a difficult year but perhaps a good time to do something like this so thank you for helping to create a very positive spirit around this uh, book project. I think that has been extremely important. 
Um, I would also like to thank the audience for all the great uh, questions. And you're, of course, welcome to email me if you have any further questions uh, about the book. And, uh, and I would also like to thank Elena for moderating and Camilla for her meticulous uh, planning as uh, always. And uh, thank you very much.